So outline is first I will tell you a little bit about systems engineering, then about system simulation, and then about the open source uh, toolkit which we are developing. Uh, it's called OpenStreetMap. Systems engineering is it, it, an interdisciplinary approach. It's a management and a technical process. Basically, it's a, a, a process on how you do engineering. So it's a lot of different uh, topics involved, like site planning, uh, uh, teaming, um, but uh, uh, most important is uh, development phasing. So uh, development phases are normally like uh, um, divide, divided into uh, four, or uh, five or six different phases. And uh, the main point here is that in the different uh, development phases of your project, from A to E, you have different tasks to fulfill. In the first phases, you have a mission function definition, then you have a second phase, you have requirements, and then detailed definition of your mission and verification and production. So, where you normally use system simulation is uh, in the verification uh, part of your project. So you do all your normal engineering, you do the definition and the requirements of your project, and then when it comes to verification, you use system simulation tools. Uh, in the early phases, often uh, uh, tools like uh, MATLAB or Excel or Word even uh, are used. Uh, here you can see an example uh, which is actually used by EADS Astrium. Uh, they do orbit definition with Excel, which is suboptimal, I would say, but they do it anyway. And um, if, if you do that, then you have a lot of work later on in the project to port all your all your findings into your into your actual system simulation tools. So, what is system simulation at all? It's a again a holistic approach uh, of modeling and studying your system and your behavior of your complex system. Um, here is a very simple uh, example. It's an onboard computer connected to a simulated uh, onboard equipment of your satellite. You have all, all what you can have, thrusters, reaction wheels, heaters, payload, batteries, and all that stuff. So you have uh, different, uh, different connections between the uh, uh, different software models. You have uh, uh, digital interfaces, you have uh, physical thermal interfaces, you have uh, uh, mechanical interfaces, and all that stuff. And you have a numerical uh, differential equation solver, which is integrating your system. But I will talk about that a little bit more in detail in the in the upcoming slides. So, complex systems is uh, at some point if you re if your if your uh, system reaches a specific degree of complexity, then you cannot like understand the behavior of the system per se anymore. You cannot make predictions if you change the variable in your system. What will be the outcome of your of, of this variable change? Not understandable means uh, in an analytical way. You can understand it though if you use a simulation tool because then you can actually test what is happening after you change your variable. Uh, here we have an, on the picture we have an example of a, of a complex system. Anybody guess what that is? Uh, actually, uh, two or three weeks or maybe a month later it looked like that. That was a control room of Chernobyl before the accident actually. Everybody knows that here I think it's what's, uh, what, what happened actually in uh, Chernobyl and uh, now it's uh, time for this little excursion um, to, because I did just a little bit of research about it and I find it very interesting and I just wanted to take the chance to quickly explain how Chernobyl exploded actually. The first problem or the first uh, phenomenon which wasn't really understood at that time is uh, it's called uh, reactor poisoning. It's um, the fact that in the uh, decay process of your uh, fission, you're getting um, uh, an element which name I currently do not recall. Iodine, uh, sorry, iodine 135, and um, it ha has a half uh, time, a half life of 6.6 uh, .6 hours, and decays to uh, xenon 135. And that again decays to uh, cesium-135 after nine, a half-life of nine hours, approximately. But also it can be uh, turned to xenon-136, uh, which is uh, by uh, catching in a neutron. So xenon-135 has a huge cross-section for thermal neutrons, which basically says all your neutrons 
which are available will get sucked up by, by Xenon, uh, Xenon 135. So what that means is, if you turn down your reactor, you will get excess because there are no neutrons available anymore, and the uh, decay rate of uh, iodine is faster than the decay of the xenon to cesium. You will have an, uh, a, a huge amount of xenon in your reactor. That's the first. Uh, uh, phenomenon which, which not, was, was not really understood at that time. The second was uh, uh, what is the positive void coefficient of your reactor. And basically what that means is um, if you have a positive void coefficient, if you have in your coolant or your uh, moderator replaced with, uh, with voids, basically with gas bubbles, then your reactivity of your reactor will go up. In the Western type uh, reactors actually its void coefficient is negative, so your reactivity of your reactor will go down if you're having uh, uh, bubbles in your system. And the last thing was the uh, uh, design of uh, the control rods. Basically what you have is, uh, if you, this is the, basically the throttle down position you have in your uh, control rod, which is actually uh, turning your reactivity down of your system. But if you pull it out, you have a moderator here, so you will have a, a throttle up position. And if you pull it out more even, um, then your reactivity will go down again. That's a very important point because what happened was they got a, a very severe xenon poisoning in, the, in, in their system, so they had to throttle up the reactor uh, largely. And, uh, and, and then they turned on a lot of uh, pumping, cooling pumps, so uh, they turned down, uh, they, they increased their temperature of their, of their coolant which is flowing through the reactor. And then they had to throttle up even more because the reactivity of the system went down. So basically what they did all the time is they pushed on the accelerator on the brake at the same time they went off. And when they finally turned on the experiment, they all they wanted to do, um, they had these like two positive feedback loops. The one is a xenon reaction, which actually now if you, if you are turning your uh, reactor up again, you see the xenon will be converted to xenon 136 and uh, the xenon 135 will vanish from your system so your reactivity of your, of your uh, reactor will increase largely. At the same time the water starts boiling so you have a positive void coefficient that means your reactivity of the reactor again uh, changes uh, or goes up which is a positive feedback loop. So and in the last uh, a second of the experiment basically, they already were in the positive feedback loop and they had basically all their control rods in this position and they wanted to turn the reactor off so they pushed all the control rods at the same time into the reactor and but before they went, before they went to this position, they went through this position which actually means like accelerating again and then everybody knows what happened, the reactor blew up. And that's just a short example of what can happen if you don't understand what you're doing in a complex system. And that is actually what uh, simulation can be used for. You can have, before you have hardware available, before you have uh, your satellite built or your complex system built, you can have a verification of your system by simulation. And you can also train your operational personnel. The operator personnel here, for example, uh, is a colleague of mine who is using the system simulation environment which we are using in this institute. Um, basically, what you can see here is a control console for, for, for the satellite. It's the same software actually the ESA uses also to control the satellites. Um, this one is the console of the uh, uh, simulator. And here you have a, a three-dimensional simulation of, your, of the attitude of the satellite. And also here you have some control procedures actually uh, like scripts controlling your uh, your ground station. So um, what you can do is you can actually like fly your satellite before you build it, and you can train your operation personnel uh, to uh, to to use uh, the satellite. And that's the uh, biggest advantages of uh, system simulation that you can actually study the behavior of your system prior of building it. That means, of course. If you have some effects in your system which you don't really understand or know about, you won't implement them in the software too, so that doesn't save you from making every mistake. But for example, if you, um, if you are having some integration problems in the, in the hardware normally, 
you most of the time can actually see them when you're integrating your system simulation. Because, for example, um, if you're having a reaction wheel and uh, you build uh, you you uh, you build it in your satellite in the wrong direction, which has actually happened in a in a, in a project, um, then you can see that already in your in your system simulation that it won't work as you expected. So, um, as already said before, uh, here we have a, a typical B process, what you use in, in, in uh, si uh, system engineering. You make your, uh, you make your requirements, uh, you define all your, your system, and you build it, you, or you buy or build or code it, um, and then you start the verification and you go up again until the, the very right, uh, and then you have a better data system. And you typically use uh, system engineering on, 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 this, on this part of the project. Um, now I will talk a little bit about what kind of, uh, what kind of uh, uh, models you have to implement or what kind of uh, behavior of your system you actually, or aspects of your system you actually have to simulate with a satellite. You, first you have your orbit, you have to propagate your orbit. Of your satellite, you have to code all the uh, gravitational um, the field models, the atmospheric drag, solar pressure, uh, body effects, and what have you, which is uh, uh, actually uh, um, having influence on your orbit. You have to uh, propagate your attitude of your satellite. Uh, as you heard, you have uh, attitude thrusters on your typical satellite, or you have reaction wheels, or any other uh, sensors, and also actuators, which are modifying your attitude of, it, of your satellite. So you have gravitational gradient of your satellite, you have moment of inertia, spinning mass, and reaction to So you need to, to uh, simulate that too. You have to simulate mechanics like solar array drives, antennas, deployable antennas, uh, and on all the mechanics you have. You have to, uh, 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 yeah, <laughs> this uh, slide is not really uh, finished, but I had to put it together yesterday evening, so I <laughs> was a little bit in a hurry. So you have to uh, also model your thermal behavior of your system, um, because uh, it is very important to know the thermal behavior of your satellite in, in the orbit, because it will get very hot and very cold, depending on, on if it's in the sunlight or not. You have your electrical system on your satellite, you have solar arrays, again, batteries, power buses, magnetical fields, which are uh, generated by, by the electric system. And you also have to, to uh, simulate your data handling. So you have to simulate your onboard computer, your data buses, interface, equipment behavior, failure modes of your equipment, what will happen if your equipment fail, stuff like that. Um, so the numerical foundations of the system simulation is all about uh, differential equation solving. Um, so uh, I didn't want to go too much into the details of the, of the, of the numericals here, but the important thing to remember is if you're doing your room and integration on your model level, meaning if you're having, a, a, for example, your orbit, or your, your satellite is flying in your orbit, then you will propagate your orbit with a room and solver. That means if you are synchronizing your models every time step, you will have on the system level, you will still have an Euler integration. So that is uh, uh, that can be a problem if you're, for example, um, simulating uh, a fluid a fl fluid uh, dynamics, like for example, you have in a in a uh, attitude thruster system, and also uh, fluid systems and also some electrical systems are all all all, all the, um, often not uh, start value problems but boundary value problems. So those are uh, uh, have to be considered too in the uh, design of your uh, numerical system. So now a few words about the open source system simulation toolkit we are developing. It's an open source tool and on the uh, left side you can see a rocket upper stage. This is what we are currently are simulating with the tool. But you can use it for system simulation for satellites but also for example for uh, chemical uh, uh, chemical plants or Every basically every complex system you can imagine. It's based on Java, and um, it is very uh, it has a very nice uh, architectural design. Again, this is a system system we are currently 
uh, uh, simulating. You have a, a hyper tank, some pipes, some filters, pressure regulators, uh, oxider, and fuel tanks, and cluster. And what I want to say with this graphics is um, these systems, all this, all these different parts of the systems are uh, basically defined, or the architecture of your system is defined by XML files. So you can actually plug them together uh, as you like. If you haven't uh, implemented a model for a pipe on time, you can reuse it and you can just uh, uh, modify it. For example, if you want to have a third helium tank right now, you can have it just uh, change the input file of the simulation. You don't have to code anything new. And also we have uh, uh, here, it was just called engine controller. This is basically an onboard computer emulator. So you can have your onboard software which you, which you are writing for your satellite. You can already test in the simulated environment. If, it, if, if the software performs like you, like you envisioned it. Um, currently, uh, Eclipse-based uh, uh, Eclipse RCT-based GUI is in the development. This is just like a very early preview. This is actually the uh, uh, view where we can can plot our ground track of our satellite on the Earth. We can have also different views of uh, uh, values like temperatures of the tanks. Mm -hmm. or uh, uh, attitude of the satellite. Also, we have, uh, as shown, shown before, we have a 3D um, visualization environment where you can see actually the orbit and, and, and the attitude of the satellite at any time. <coughs> so, what will be uh, what will happen next with the Open Simcad? It's um, we will uh, code more models, more generic models like uh, we already have an orbit propagator and attitude propagator and. Like all the all pipings and tubes, what you saw, but we have, still have to do like reaction wheels and uh, and a lot of attitude sensors still have to be implemented. If you want to uh, uh, know more, uh, also we have to uh, uh, improve the GUI and we have uh, to implement a central solver, which actually will uh, uh, will help you to code models where you don't have to code the um, the uh, integrator of your differential equation in your model, but it will be the central solver which will do that for you. And if you want to check out uh, what is going on in the project, you can check out uh, opensimpit.org, our website. And if you happen to be around here in Stuttgart, uh, on the 9th of November, there will be a developer meeting where all the core developers of the project come together and will have uh, a meeting and uh, decide what to do next and also code. and. If there are new people interested in the project, show them how to use the program. So that's pretty much it. Thank you very much. Uh, no, actually, that's not uh, that, that's not the case. We uh, the behavior of our models we don't uh, uh, describe in XML. The behavior of, 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 of every uh, of every single model is coded inside the model source code. Meaning only in Java. yeah, meaning in Java. Only the uh, uh, the architecture of the system Interface is defined. In, yeah, excellent. Actually, what you do is we have two different two different ways of connecting models to each other. The one is uh, called a port. It does pretty much what it says. You can connect one model to another by a port. You define that in your XML file, like putting together pipes. Sure. So there's a, there's a physical flow between the models, or like if you're having a, a current. But also you can have a different architectural feature, which is called a publisher subscriber. So if you're having, for example, a gravitational field, which is no like real connection to another model, but you have different models which are needing, uh, for example, the gravitational acceleration, you can also plug that together in the XML files. So there are two different ways. One is the physical interaction between two models, and the one, other one is like an interaction which you have in, 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 uh, uh, between models which are not physically connected, but need to share some information. But the, the real like behavior, like the differential equation of your model, or the states of your of your equipment, you have to code into into the source code into the Java software. I'll talk to you later. I have okay, some sure. thoughts. Okay, I have a question. Sure. Uh, what what control do you use? Computation time do you need for one simulation? So uh, actually, um, it runs uh, right now. It's uh, the kernel is not really like uh, optimized for for multi-threaded. 
uh, I did some little tweaks for, for multi-threaded uh, uh, or multi-core computers. But on, on my laptop, it runs with, depending on your model complexity, but like this, uh, this um, fuel system, which is actually pretty uh, complex because in the, in the tubings, there's all the, uh, all the uh, thermodynamic behavior of, it, of your gas. Is, is, is modeled in, the, in every tubing, so you have a like, thermal flow between, between the walls of your tubing and the, and the, and the liquid or the, the gas. So it's pretty complex and it runs like, I mean, like 10 times is real time. But you can, you can, you can actually define also your, your integration step size and your, uh, and, your, and your computational speed in your XML file and you can set it into real time if you want. It's not hard real time right now, but it's it's working in real time because we can calculate faster than real time. And also, if you're having a, an onboard computer emulator in your system simulation, for sure you need to do it in real time because your onboard software will also run in real time. But you can. It, it depends on your step size you're choosing. simulation to a real system to see if it actually simulates it correctly? Um, actually, yeah. Uh, we are, let's say, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, Yain. <laughs> we have to compare, yes. we have compared it to, to uh, uh, multiple other simulators. But we are, uh, with, with, with the, uh, the system we are using in our university institute, or right here, basically, is, um, where is it? Uh, it's built by the ADS Astrium and they are using it for, for building their satellites since CryoSat. So uh, it's pretty much validated. And we checked our simulator against that. So uh, it's it, it pretty much doing the same. With the orbit dynamics and the, uh, and the attitude dynamics. We didn't check it with the fluid dynamics because it, we are not doing that in this simulator. But yeah, we, we checked it against that simulator and also against MATLAB-based simulation, which we which we did for our uh, of the, the uh, energy control algorithms for our satellite. So we are pretty sure that it does the right thing. But you have to do that for every time because we are building basically what you are doing is a, is a framework. So if you are if you are having a model or you are having a specific mission. You have to build the models of your equipments yourself, yes. because they are not generic most of the time. The, the different the equipments they, they, they behave different, so you have to do it anyway. So you have to verify your own simulator if you build, build your own. It's not like an out of the box thing which you just like use. You have to build your own simulator, and uh, you have to verify it against your own like, experience. In order to, to start in uh, on your project, you also have to um, apply worst case scenarios. Um, yeah. it, do you have some kind of bug or something where you can check where the problem is in your system? Or do you just, okay, no, it's not reacting like I want it to? Um, and no, actually, you have to go find the, the mistake. Actually, you have, um, um, you have the um, different, um, uh, uh, different possibilities to. Of, of communication between your models, like I told you, you have like, for example, here, or you have different variables. You have your, your temperature of your fuel, you have your density of your fuel, and all that thermodynamic variables, for example. So uh, all those variables, you can also define in your XML file that you want to have them locked into a specific file, or you can also in runtime you can ask the simulator for the for the current value of the variable, and you can stop for example, at every time the simulation. So you can monitor your variables and you can uh, uh, check if something is going wrong. So for example, if it's going to, to be too hot or too warm, uh, too cold, or if, you're, if, if, you're, if your attitude of your satellite is not in a predicted range anymore. Um, actually, I did a presentation on the last IAC Congress about that I have an automatic checking of requirements. If you're having a requirement, you can have, have your requirement defined in a requirement engineering tool, and this requirement will be automatically, if you do it in the way that I described in my paper, you, the requirement will be automatically checked by the simulator. 
So like some tells you no, your requirement is not. Yeah, so in, for example, if your requirement is my onboard computer should always be between uh, 20 and 40 degrees of Celsius mm -hmm. in the temperature range, and you drop out of that range, uh, that will be automatically recorded. Okay. Like you're getting, getting a, a non confirmed uh, uh, non uh, yeah, report. You're getting a report that your requirement was not met in the, in the, in the simulation. Okay. Actually, I think, um, okay, some features I can't really compare because most of the commercial uh, 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 tools are closed source. So I can't look into the sources, but we have a very nice architecture, software architecture, which makes uh, uh, coding models also very easy. Basically, what you do, to, uh, you, you, you have to do is you're having a, 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 if you start a new model, you're having to uh, inherit from a specific base model which we have implemented, and then you basically have to do like three functions. But that depends on your complexity of the model. But if you have a simple model, it's basically like two or three functions which you have to implement. And then you have your, your new model design. So it's very easy to build new models. Um, also, Java allows us to do some very nice software architecture in your model. If you know what you're doing. If you're, for example, using MATLAB, you will have... You cannot do a lot of software architecture stuff. Because you have just a procedural uh, language, basically which prohibits a lot of nice stuff. And um, that is, I think, one big uh, advantage. Also, an advantage is that you can do uh, faster in real time and also real time simulations. If you, are, for example, wanted to have a MATLAB environment with, with hardware in the loop in real time, it's pretty complicated to do that. So it scales very nicely about, uh, over, your, over your development time. In the beginning, you want to have faster than real-time simulation to make some quick studies. And in the end, you want to have to, for, for verification of your software, you will have to have real-time simulation. That's also a good, good uh, advantage of our tool. And I think the most important advantage is that it's open source. So you can use it and try it and, and, and contribute it and uh, yeah, just make it better. And you can actually like verify our code yourself. You can't do that. This I know everybody trusts MATLAB, <laughs> but still you can if you if you really want to. You cannot verify it yourself because it's it's closed source. You cannot you cannot see the current code as well. Okay. Thanks. Any questions left? Okay, then I think we are good. And outside there's free lunch for everybody. So enjoy. Enjoy.